why do we care so much about China? Well, it's obvious why our, our Chinese friends here would focus their attention on the present and the future of their homeland. But what about the rest of us? Not only Americans, but people in Asia and around the world. And the man who taught me the most about China was Dr. Walter Judd, who lived and worked in South China and then North China for a decade. And when he was asked why China is so important, he would stretch out his hand and say, here is Asia. Here is Asia. My palm is China, the Middle Kingdom, and my fingers are the nations branching out from China. Japan, Korea, Indochina, the Philippines, Indonesia. And when China is at peace and accepts the idea of freedom and democracy, Dr. Judd would say, then all of Asia is at peace and lives in freedom. But if China builds a mighty military machine and tries to bully its neighbors, then all of Asia is threatened. The same analogy can be applied internationally. China is at the center of global commerce and trading. It competes with the US, <coughs> Russia, Japan, Germany, and the EU and other nations. And if China abides by the rules of fair trade and international law, the world is at peace and accepts China as an integral member of the community of nations. But if China is aggressive, and not only in economic matters, we think here particularly of cybersecurity, then the world becomes uneasy and troubled. And that's why China matters to everyone. And if we want to understand China, we must understand the central role of the Communist Party in the management of China's affairs. And as Dr. DeCotter will explain in more detail when he speaks, uh, beginning in the 1920s, China suffered through this brutal civil war between the Red Army of Mao Zedong and the Nationalist Army of Chiang Kai-shek. By the early 1930s, Chiang had gained the upper hand and instituted a promising program of reconstruction and economic development for the new Republic of China. This is an unknown part of Chinese history, and I hope that perhaps some of the professors here and academics here will take a little closer look at that. It really was extraordinary what was accomplished in those few brief years in the early 30s and before the Japanese invaded China in 1937. Mao, as we know, holed up in Yunnan in northern China, seemingly no longer a factor in Chinese affair. And then came a turning point in China's history and in world history. The Japanese invaded China in 1937, starting the Sino-Japanese War. And Chang and Mao reluctantly came together and joined forces against a common enemy. It is a fact that for the next eight years, the nationalists bore the brunt of the Japanese invasion, sacrificing the lives of an estimated two million Chinese soldiers. Losses on the Japanese side were perhaps one million Japanese troops. Now the communists, yes, yes, they fought, but mostly as guerrillas, and when they could engage with a smaller enemy. Mao's strategy was revealed in a secret directive, which was published a decade later, and I quote. This is Mao looking at what the party should do at this period 
of the war against Japan. Quote, the Sino-Japanese War affords our party an excellent opportunity for expansion. Our policy should be 70% expansion, and he meant expansion of the party, 20% dealing with the nationalists, and 10% resisting Japan. With Japan's unditional surrender in August of 1945, the communists restarted China's dormant civil war. At first, it was official U.S. policies to support the nationalists, consistent with pledges that President Roosevelt had made to Chiang Kai-shek at the Cairo Conference in November of 1943. But pro-communist American diplomats in China began to advocate a united front of nationalists and communists. And they reassured Washington, Mao and his colleagues were simply, quote, agrarian reformers. When China fell uh, to the communists, the US State Department denied any responsibility for that loss in 1949, but Dr. Judd and others disagreed. He pointed out that the U.S. had contributed decisively to the fall of China to the communists, first with the Yalta Conference, which gave the Soviets effective control of Manchuria after promising it to nationalist China at Cairo, and second with the 1946-47 embargo that deprived the nationalists of ammunition at a critical point in the Civil War. As Dr. Judd and others knew so well, the impact of that loss, of that victory for the communists would be profound and long-lasting. Quote, communist conquest of China is a mortal peril to all of Asia. And Dr. Judd was proven right, first by the Korean War and then the Vietnam War in both of which communist China played a key supporting role. So the history of communist China is really the history of the Chinese Communist Party, which has been at the center of all the pivotal events of the modern China, including the 100 Flowers Movement, the Great Leap Forward, the Chinese Cultural Revolution, and the Tiananmen Square Massacre. None of these tragedies would have happened without the endorsement and the direction of the Chinese Communist Party, and particularly its leader, Mao Zedong. After the Hundred Flowers movement had resulted in Mao and other party members cutting off the heads of those who had dared to speak out for freedom and democracy, Mao said, boasted. <laughs> What did Emperor Shi Huang of the Qin Dynasty do? He only buried alive 460 scholars. We buried 46,000. Mao reveled in murder. With its 88 million members, I repeat, 88 million members, the Chinese Communist Party is involved in every aspect of Chinese life from schools to factories, from the countryside to the coastal regions, from the stock market to the People's Liberation Army, from the Lao Gai to the People's Daily. Mao said that political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. In China, it is the Communist Party that controls the gun. Just about a decade ago, I was in Beijing and Shanghai. And believe it or not, at the invitation of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the People's Republic of China. Is that possible? Yes. They wanted me to lecture on conservatism, the conservative movement. But I explained to my hosts that I could not discuss the American conservative movement 
without explaining the centrality of anti-communism to its philosophy. My host said they understood. And so I talked about the horrific loss of human life in the Great Leap Forward, when at least 30 million Chinese, the number now is, we don't really know, could be 40, could be 50 million, as a result of Mao's forced collectivism. That was a serious mistake, my hosts agreed. Bad. Well, then I talked about the great cultural revolution when China was plunged into chaos for a decade. The Red Guards roaming the countryside. Mao then had to call on the PLA to put down the Red Guards. Yes, my hosts admitted, that was Chairman Mao's idea and a bad one. And then I brought up the Tiananmen Square massacre. And my hosts fell silent. They would not talk about it. They would not admit it. They would not say a single word about that terrible, terrible event some 26 years ago. Four blocks from here is the Victims of Communism Memorial. And I hope that you have a chance to see it if you haven't already done so. It's at the intersection of Massachusetts Avenue and New Jersey Avenue, just two blocks from Union Station, our train station. And there is the memorial. It is the world's first and still only memorial to all the victims of communism. And at the center of our memorial, is a bronze replica of the Goddess of Democracy statue, erected by those courageous Chinese students 26 years ago. We have some of those who were there in Tiananmen Square with us uh, today and this morning. Many different icons of communism were suggested to us before we, we built the memorial. Maybe some representation of Lenin or Stalin or Castro or Pol Pot, the Iron Curtain, the Berlin Wall, the killing fields of Cambodia. But we selected the goddess of democracy because it's a remainder and a reminder of what communists will not hesitate to do when their tyrannical rule is challenged. We also picked the goddess of democracy because it's based on the American Statue of Liberty and has become a symbol of freedom around the world. On the front pedestal of our statue are the words to the more than 100 million victims of communism and to those who love liberty. On the back pedestal are the words to the freedom and independence of all captive nations and peoples. I truly believe that the day is coming and sooner than the Chinese government realizes when the Chinese people will be free and live under a government of their choosing. Let me conclude with, again, going back to my, my mentor, Walter Judd. In August of 1989, it was two months after the Tiananmen Square massacre, Dr. Judd, who was perhaps the most outspoken anti-communist uh, in Washington and maybe, maybe in the country, in America, Dr. Judd startled a Washington audience by describing the Tiananmen Square massacre as, quote, one of the most encouraging things that's happened in China in a long time. How could he say that? What did he mean? It was encouraging, he said, because, quote, it proves that communism has failed to satisfy the wishes and wants of the people. The Chinese communists, quote, have exposed themselves until even the blindest can see that they are barbarians. They're not true Chinese. Dr. Judd predicted there would be other rebellions in China. They might be, perhaps, crushed. 
But nevertheless, he felt that an end to communism's control was in sight, perhaps in another decade or two, because the desire for freedom beats in the breasts of every human being, whether they're American or Chinese or Russian or Cambodian or whatever they might be. Chinese communism, he said, was doomed to failure because of the corruption of party members. The long-range determination of a new generation in China, and many members of that generation are with us today and at this forum. And the sweep of history, which is working against communism and for freedom. And then he said something which I've always held so close to me and I've never forgotten. Quote, tyrants have always looked invincible until the last five minutes and then all of a sudden they fall apart. Well, was that just wishful thinking on his part in August of 1989? But consider, three months later the Berlin Wall came tumbling down and communism collapsed in Eastern and Central Europe followed two years later by the dissolution of the Soviet Empire. Of the present communist regime in China, Dr. Judd would say, I think, that barriers remain, political barriers to free elections and a free press, economic barriers to a true market economy, and the right to work at a job of your choosing. But in the end, however long it may take, however many Tiananmen squares may be necessary, missionaries like Walter Judd and may I say, like myself, are confident that freedom will triumph in China. Thank you very much.